Well, the basic technique is, uh, let me just move a few mutes here. I'll tell you about the mutes in a minute. But the basic technique is to produce a sustained tone with nylon fish line. And it's rosined. We use either a spray rosin from a, from a can, like this, or cake rosin of the sort that a violin player would use. And that creates the friction that allows the string to vibrate, causes the string to vibrate. mutes from uh, two materials, a brown one and a white one that we mix together to make this sort of uh, old pencil eraser colored stuff. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of synthetic rubber. Uh, it's flexible. This one isn't too flexible because uh, it mutes three different pitches. There's, that's for one string, that's for, the, or for one pitch, the three strings of, say, the A flat. That would be the three strings of the A, the three strings of the B flat. Um, these, the smaller ones, I can show how they're more, uh, more flexible. You can bend them and twist them and so on, and they keep their shape, they have a memory. So these go on the, on the string to change the sound from the ordinary piano sound, which is very bright and has a lot of uh, sustaining power too. Achieve this with the finger. Also, you can mute the finger. Uh, with the finger, you can mute the pitch. But the advantage of these of these mutes is you can put them on, take them off, and then once they're on, you have hands free, so you don't need to use your precious resources of the players to, to do that the muting with the fingers. So that's the primary technique, and the one that I started with, and the one that I borrowed from Curtis Curtis Smith. Um, another one is a short uh, stick of wood. This is actually a tongue depressor. And it has horsehair, violin bow type horsehair, uh, tied and glued and, and uh, taped, in this case with a kind of shrink wrap, to, to the stick. This one has horsehair on two sides so that I can play adjacent pitches. This doesn't produce as big a sound. Uh, and I often have these organized with several players, with two bows sometimes, so each player can play up to four different pitches. And these are organized in rhythmic, rhythmic patterns. Um, The lower strings of the piano are wound with copper. And so there's a steel string in the middle, and then there's this copper winding to give it more mass and more weight, and that's, that produces the lower pitch. And the nylon fish line doesn't work so well on these. Because they're wound, and they have these little coils, the nylon can get caught in those windings and uh, doesn't produce the kind of friction, doesn't have the surface area that something like this does. tape that's made for plumbing repairs. You can wrap this tightly around a leak and you know, it'll, it'll do till the plumber arrives. So we use quite a few of those in the lowest octave of the piano. We also use piano hammers and these are were taken from a piano that was being rebuilt and had new hammers placed.
there's a technique in violin playing or cello playing where you use the wood of the bow. It's called coleno, the Italian phrase. So I use the, the I borrowed the phrase coleno for the wood part of the hammer. And again, if you have several players using these in interlocking patterns, you can make very complex uh, polyrhythms. So these are also excellent for percussive sounds on the frame. Especially if I have two hammers, for example, or I have two players playing in interlocking patterns. There are many parts of the piano that produce resonant tones. The string ends here are uh, produce very uh, lovely kind of bell-like tones. The stick of the beater, this is a very small uh, beater for child's percussion. Um, try to find as many um, interesting resonant areas as we can in the piano, sometimes the soundboard directly. Although I like to be careful of the soundboard, especially if it's a piano that's not mine, if we're playing someone else's piano. The soundboard is usually off-limits, um, and many things on the frame in the case are off-limits. This is a particularly resonant sound, this piano uses quite a bit. Sometimes I'll use that for a pulse if I need an organizing beat to keep everyone together. Because these are fastened to the frame, it goes right to the soundboard, and so there's a great deal of resonance you can get there. But this kind of thing varies immensely from one piano to another, so when we're touring and we, we're playing on a different piano we're not familiar with, we have to relearn the instrument, really. And also the structure of the brace is, bracing is different, as you know, I'm sure, from a Steinway, say, to a Baldwin, which this is. It's very different. Some European pianos have, um, this brace comes about this far and then ends, and there's nothing here, and so we have nothing to fasten these devices to. These are what are called bow traps. Uh, for the obvious reason, I guess, that they they keep the bow in place. You take it from that place and you put it back in the same place and it has a color code both on the tabs of the bow and in this case also on the plastic where we store it. So we know that only the A4 bow goes there, for example. We number the pitches starting with the very lowest A on the piano as number one all the way up to C8. Um, and so often in my instructions I will indicate either in a score or verbally or in some written way to a player what pitch and what register they're playing. So a B-flat 4 is, is only one pitch, it's not the same as any other B-flat, obviously. Um, and these are little parts uh, for individual players. For example, there's, there's um, uh, you know, a place in one of the pieces where a player just plays a very simple muted figure at the keyboard. Oh, let's see, let's put on some mutes for that. And I'll do a different part. Um, yeah. That's a pattern with some it's an asymmetry to it. And uh, he has to play that many, many times. And so the, the part just allows a, a little sort of a you know, reminder. You play this 23 times, and then you go on to a variation of it and so on. So we have lots of these inside the piano. We've just been rehearsing uh, this fairly large piece. So as a memory aid, we use these. But by and large, uh, the compositions are memorized by the time we perform them. Because there's no place in here to put music. You can have the score over here. 
on the stand, you can refer to it. Uh, if you get lost, I use color codes for not only for the pitches but for the players so that, for example, my color is red and I'm player number 10. I can read that, even at my advanced age, I can read that from here because it's got a big red rectangle. And I, by then I know what pitch it is, I know what bow I'm supposed to play. So we use a lot of color for that reason inside the piano. And there are color codes here on the, the dampers. A few of them are missing. Uh, if I need to reach in and uh, pluck, for example, this note, I know where it is uh, because it's blue. It's, it's an E, and E is a light blue. And next to it I have a black and red, which is F. See, I have a color code that tells me so I can find it easily. Because every string looks like about every other string in, inside the piano. You don't have the black and white reference of the keyboard to tell what you are. Um, so, what about your spoon over there? Oh, yes. <laughs> I wonder if you'd ask me that. This is, <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a new invention. It's actually, it's just a way of... Um, um, it's, it's a handle actually for a pick or a plectrum. Um, and in this new piece, I've got some uh, sort of tremolo figures like this. It's kind of hard to do, and I'm not practiced at it. I have a player who's very expert at this now. Um, she discovered that if she just used a pick, she didn't get the kind of stability she wanted, and, and uh, so we ended up, actually we were using a spoon, just a plastic spoon, the, the end of it, uh, and that didn't seem to have quite the flexibility that, that she wanted, and so she, she put a pick on the end. So it's just kind of a handle for a pick, actually. And again, I'm not very good at this, so I can't give it its full potential. Uh, so we call it the spoon tremolo, just because the spoon ended up being a handy you know, so everybody has plastic spoons around. Um, and uh, let's see, what, I, what haven't I mentioned that is in here? The mute material is, uh, comes from a product called Brace Guard, and this is, was invented so, uh, to allow brass players, especially adolescent brass players who were wearing braces on their teeth, uh, to form a kind of uh, Oh, sort of boxer style protection for, for their lip when they're playing brass instruments like trumpet and trombone. And uh, so you can order this stuff and it comes in a, in a, in a little kit with brown and white goo and uh, they remain pliable until you mix them together and then kind of like epoxy they form up um, and they turn into a solid, a flexible solid. So um, we found that this makes, these, this makes tremendous mutes for the instrument, so we can have this kind of... And I don't use any keyboard um, sounds that are not muted or in some other way altered. Uh, for a long while I religiously avoided the keyboard altogether for many pieces. Um, and because I guess I wanted to kind of make the point that there's a lot of music in here that's, that you don't have to use the keyboard to play, uh, to make. But um, eventually I succumbed to the, the uh, sort of seductive power of having players being able to play a lot of notes at one time, <laughs> which is why the piano was invented as it was anyway. Do you ever use a more conventional kinds of preparation, whether it's stones bouncing on the strings or nuts and bolts paper? Occasionally, especially in improvised contexts. I haven't really used nuts and bolts in this, in this ensemble. Um, I think maybe partly because, you know, you were alluding to this earlier that, that this has sort of become my thing and other people, you know, might kind of tend to stay away from it because that identified with me. Um, because the, the, the nut and bolt and screw preparations are so associated with cage. Um, I've just, uh, I'm not consciously, I guess, but um, you know, not systematically avoided those, but I've just found that I haven't, uh, um, haven't needed those sounds or, or haven't been particularly inclined to, to 
to use them. Sometimes surface preparations, paper and other things that you can you can put on the on the strings of the instrument. Um, and I've done some things with harmonics, uh, which I guess I haven't really mentioned, but. You can, you can obviously produce, maybe it's not obvious, but you can produce harmonics with these bows if you find the node, that's the fifth partial of that, of that fundamental. We have violinists, wood or guitars, but they're hard to control. Also, that pitch is muted, which makes a difference. But the more useful harmonics I found are, for me anyway, for my purpose, um, involve this uh, this rigid bow, as I call it, this stick bow with horsehair. fabric is essentially just to keep things quiet. If I, if I have to play this and drop it quickly and move to something else, uh, if, if I drop it there, it makes noise that I don't want. So it does have the effect of slightly dampening the resonance of the instrument, uh, which is a, a kind of trade-off that we, we live with. These are for fishing things out that fell through. Exactly, and they're also for, uh, for loading the boats when we prepare. Um, it's easier to, if I may, it's easier just to, uh, let's see if I can find the right pitch for this. Okay, um, just put it in and then grab it with the tweezers. So, but also for fishing things out that fall down, absolutely. We drop all kinds of things in here. And normally during a performance we'll just leave them, but in rehearsal, you know, you want to retrieve your objects. So for that purpose. Uh, we also, um, I guess I mentioned there are, there are some color codes we apply to the strings. That's done with um, little artist's crayons like this. So, uh, for example, the dark blue means that that's a B and so on. We don't apply the colors to these strings, at least on a piano that we're playing that's not our piano. Uh, I don't have any in now, but we use colored threads sometimes to indicate what the pitches are. Because you can tie that on and then you can remove it when you're, when you're finished. So during performance you must have a pretty good lighting situation, otherwise you can't play this in the dark. Absolutely. Can, we, we, we can play very simple things in the dark. <laughs> uh, in fact, we, we did a piece in which we began in darkness, uh, Vikings of the Sunrise, um, which is a big piece I did, which we recorded in '96. We um, uh, we began the performance in the dark, and we had um, glow-in-the-dark markers for the bows that we needed to begin with, and then gradually the light uh, came up. Uh, and we also marked the we marked the edges of the piano. I may even still have some here. Uh, well, there's a little dot there, <laughs> a little glow-in-the-dark dot. So we had the corners marked and certain player positions so that we could enter from off stage come to the piano, you know, in the dark, begin the long drones that start that piece, and then have the lights come up. But essentially, we need a lot of white light right in the piano. Um, and overhead is, is best. If you have lights coming in from the side, they create shadows from the strings on the soundboard, and it makes it very difficult to find where you are. Sometimes that can be really disorienting. So sometimes we'll show up in a very elaborate concert hall, and the lighting crew is ready to do all their purple and blue and orange and, and, and we say, sorry, <laughs> we just need, we need a lot of white light. You know, to see all these colors, for example, you just you really have to have that. Do you have special wedges for the pedals? Uh, we do. Yeah. They're not fancy at all. We just cut, cut a little wedge out of a piece of wood. And that goes either, either here or in some pianos, this one, for example, it, it, it works better behind the pedal, but it you can actually wedge it there as well. Uh, so we wedge both the damper pedal and sometimes the sostenuto pedal. Um, and what the sostenuto pedal does is to uh, hold up certain dampers that you might want to use. For example, 
while you might have other things undo. So we use both a combination of people's feet, uh, you know, in sometimes in choreographed patterns, and also wedges if we need to have those pedals down for any length of time. So one of the playing techniques is sometimes for a player who's kind of in this area for some other purpose to, to go down here occasionally and wedge or unwedge a pedal as well. And then we have foot tapping signals and all kinds of things to, you know, communicate between people who would be up here. And the people down there. Have you ever actually bowed a harpsichord? I have tried it. Yes, um, it's much harder to get a harpsichord owner uh, to let you uh, <laughs> bow a harpsichord than it is with a piano. Um, uh, it can produce a very, uh, a very, uh, a very nice sound. It's uh, it's delicate. It's pretty. Uh, it, you know, since the harpsichord itself doesn't have the dynamic power that the piano does. Um, you can't get as big a sound, but and boat guitar, a guitar. A lot of people worked with that, like laying a guitar flat, either an acoustic guitar, you know, with a microphone or uh, with its own pickup and amplifier. Now with guitars, they have the the ebo. Can, yes. can you use that on this? You can. Um, I haven't used ebos. Uh, Alvin Lucier has done that quite a bit, and has called for that uh, in some of his pieces, and I think other other composers as well. I actually did. Um, a student of mine, not here, but at the Evergreen State College where I taught for, for a year, a student helped me develop an electromagnetic bow for the piano. And um, and I still have it around. It's I don't think it's in this room. It's probably in pieces back in the shop. But what it amounted to was 12 uh, electromagnets, one for each pitch in a 12-tone in a octave. So you could set it, for example, between C and B uh, and have all those 12 chromatic tones, and, and each one was driven by an oscillator that could be tuned to the frequency of that string. And these were just suspended over the string, uh, so that either by using its own keyboard, it had its own little keyboard, or by having all of the magnets uh, functional at, at one time, and then depressing the key and raising the damper, you could allow that string to, to vibrate. Um, and I, there's one piece on my first recording, the, the um, music for a bowed piano recording called Resonant Resources, which uses that little device. Um, and it was fun to play with, and I, for a while I toyed with the idea of having an entire a keyboard covered by these magnets, but uh, it became impractical for various reasons to, to pursue that. And besides, I finally decided that I just I really liked the, uh, the physicality of people making sounds directly on the strings rather than using a device like the Ebo. But it's a lovely, it's a lovely sound that's available with those electronic bows.